So tell me if you've heard this one before. It takes a village. <laughs> yes. Yep, you have heard that, right? Especially here at Village Church. It's like it's something we often say. Uh, a lot of times when we are congratulating ourselves, right? You know, we've, we've done something really good and we're like, yes, it takes a village and we're village. But we also hear it when we're not so congratulatory, when we're reminding ourselves, reminding one another that stuff needs to get done. And we can't just rely on the faithful few, like, it takes a village to do this Sunday morning thing, right? To design worship, to record it, to post it, to set up the table, to greet people. Hi, Vicki, you're a greeter this morning, yes. To collect and count the offering, to provide the bread, to read, to clean up the occasional spill. And hey, look, this now is unspillable. That one looks pretty good too, yeah, that's good, yeah. Last week there was a little bit of a coffee spill. Some, someone kicked my coffee over. I'm not gonna name any names. Anyway, I didn't even see who did it. But, and of course, to make the coffee, which is really important, right? And by the way, I am challenging myself to see how many weeks in a row that I can insert a reference to coffee in my sermons. I think I'm at three. Not sure. Yes, it takes a village to get her done, so to speak. But the converse is also true. As we heard this morning, it can also take a village to, well, ruin a perfectly good thing. Now, I don't need to actually spend, I don't think, time trying to calculate what the exact number it requires, the critical mass of negativity necessary because, well, you know what? We've all experienced it. Don't, you don't really need a whole village to bring a place down. We all know the power of an individual in our families or at work, not ever in the church, but, you know, somewhere else the condo association, who knows? We all know that there is always that one person who almost like gravity can literally suck the life force from an event, like a Debbie Downer, dragging everything, well, down. Now imagine, if you will, a whole, or almost a whole village like we heard about in our gospel for this morning, Jesus' own hometown. Of course, we'd like to think that the good people of that village, that village, would be proud of their hometown boy made good. After all, it wasn't a big place. This wasn't some cosmopolitan city teeming with strangers. No, these people knew Jesus. They'd seen him. They'd seen him as a child, perhaps as an awkward teenager with even pimples and stuff, acne, who knows? A young man. And they'd watched him one day walk away, leave that family the brothers and his sisters, and by the way, as a Lutheran congregation in that denomination, we have no problem with them being actual or biological siblings, children of Mary, which by the way, when you heard her name in the gospel, you might not have batted an eye when we heard her name, because we lift up, we're like, oh Mary, mother of Jesus, mother of our Lord, but you know what? When it's used in this gospel, when the people of that village say her name, it's not quite so positive. Remember, that time, that place, that culture, 
was very patriarchal. We can complain about the patriarchies today, ladies and, and gents too, but that was so much more. Their culture, their system was so male-centric. Men had the power and everyone was referenced to, usually in relation to that potter, the name, the father, except Jesus. <laughs> Not in this instance. There is no mention of father. There is no mention of a Joseph. He's missing. Not in the picture. And in that world, let's just say it's not optimal. Or more accurately, on some level, shameful. So what is this guy, Jesus? This guy who should have stayed with his family, should have stayed in his lane. After all, he should be working with wood, not working wonders. He's a craftsman, not a cure of diseases. He's a tradesman, not a teacher traipsing around the countryside. Here he comes home. It takes a village to welcome back a hero, but that's not what he gets. He gets the side eye. He gets whispers behind the back. He gets outright criticism. There is no Midwest nice in this village. No. This, by the way, is a rejection, but this is in no way a rejection that would warrant any anti-Semitism. There's no reason for anti-Semitism. There's no basis for it. And I'm backing up. Our first reading, talking about the rebellious people that the prophet was sent to. We're all rebellious. This is not this idea that Judaism is now spurned and Jews are bad people. We need to put that out of all of our heads and our language. That is not what was going on. And these texts cannot be used for that. Jesus was Jewish. His followers were Jewish. All the villages were around him were Jewish. So it takes a village. And I can, whoop, I skipped a whole paragraph. That's what happens. It takes a village to welcome back a hero, right? So it takes a village of suspicions and jealousies and criticism to stifle the saving power of Jesus. Because Mark tells us that Jesus could not. This is not a would not. This isn't like, well, I'm going to take my good stuff somewhere else. This is Jesus not able to do great deeds of power, oh, well, except for healing a few people. That, you know, what does that mean? But anyway, why do you think he couldn't? Why might Jesus not have been able to do some great deeds of power in this village? Could people have just avoided him? Why bother? You know, it's just, he's just that carpenter. Let's not all just go and get healed and, and hear him and do all this. So it could be that people just basically didn't even participate. They could, didn't even allow him to do the ministry he wanted to. Or, oh, you're doing that. Okay, got it. Or just with their negativity. Just with their criticism, they could squelch the power of the Spirit. And I don't think this is some heresy at all. They could, if the Romans could kill Jesus's body, I'm sure that the criticism could sap his strength. If the Romans can slay him, the villagers could shatter his spirit. So it takes a village. 
And I can just imagine Jesus, after leaving his hometown, that village beside, and behind him, I can imagine him saying, I'll show you. I'll show you. And by the way, I think he actually would have said, we'll show you. We'll show you. Not wheel as in spinning. You never know where my sermons go, but that's not where this one's headed, not downhill. Maybe. maybe. But he wasn't going to let one small village squelch the good news of the kingdom. So what did Jesus do? Did he go off and pout? No. He expanded. He multiplied his reach, his impact by sending out the 12, sending out his followers. And here, I think, is a lesson learned. He did not send them out alone. He did not send them out alone, but two by two, a pair, two to support one another. Because you know what? We're not in this alone. Two to look after one another. Two, to be a village to one another. So that those little teams could know that, you know what, we're not in it by ourselves. We aren't self-sustaining. This is the power of interdependence. So they didn't pack and haul and provide for themselves. It wasn't, we just got to do this on our own. They had to rely on hospitality of others. And if you're wondering about the not moving from house to house, it was so that they wouldn't go from, like they heard that this house makes better soup and, and head to that other house or, you know, their beds are softer over there. No, it was just stay put, be in the one you're at and stay there. Rely on the people you meet. They couldn't just swoop in with a few words and move on, but they had to sit with the people. They had to eat with them. They had to listen to their stories and be with them. They had to village with them. Wait, I think I just made a new word. I think I did. I used it as a verb, to village, to village someone. I think that's something we should do, to village, to accompany someone to eat and drink and to listen and to sit with someone and to share with them, to share their joys, to share their pains, to share love. It takes a village. And that's our name. Isn't that lucky? Isn't that just a cute happenstance in this sermon? It takes a village. That's our name. And just like thousands of years ago, thousands of miles away, we are followers of Jesus. And we get to village here. We get to village here. We get to village the love of God, not just in this space, but wherever we are, everywhere, to take that love of God with us. Now, I'm going to share just a little bit. Um, Bill Wood's not here with us um, this morning. He was, but he went home. And thank you, Bill, for taking him home. He wasn't feeling well. One of my a side gig I do is I visit members of another church. And I was visiting this person, Bonnie, and she, she knows I'm also the pastor here. And she asked about Bill Wood. And evidently, in another congregation where they both had been members a long time ago, Capital Drive, Bonnie had been going through a very hard time, it, a long time of grief and pain and struggle. And one Sunday morning, that grief hit her like a train. And I don't, she, didn't, she didn't say what was going on in the worship or whatever. She just said she walked out of the building just shaking in tears and in pain. She couldn't even hold it in. And Bill Wood walked over to her and just put his arms around her and just held her while she cried. 
this is like, I would say, a, at least a good 20, maybe 30 years ago, a long time ago. But what Bill did carries with her. She carried that. She carried that love of God that he surrounded her with in her need. His villaging. Because it does take a village. And we are village. Amen. <laughs>